Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> chapter 11 is about vibrations and waves, and chapter 12 is about sound, and that's where our curriculum ends. So I'm going to walk through the first half of the chapter. This uh, cuts down on file size, so it makes viewing a little bit easier, and that means that's going to take us through the vibrations component, and then I'll do another recording on Wednesday for the second half of chapter 11, which is going to be waves. Okay. So as we take a look, <clears throat> we're going to walk through the first four bullets tonight. We'll define simple harmonic motion. <clears throat> we'll take a look at how energy conservation works. And then we'll look at the motion components too. So simple harmonic motion comes from Hooke's law, again. And Hooke's law um, is one of the older laws and one of the easier ones that we have in physics, which again gets me annoyed that someone would get their name after such a simple equation, but that's regardless. <laughs> so the key thing is that we have a force that's caused by a displacement. And we've seen this uh, uh, many times, but the minus sign is really important. So what does the minus sign means? It means that when we displace this mass a little bit, that what the spring tries to do is oppose that displacement and tries to bring it back to some equilibrium position. But because the force is proportional to the displacement, there's actually no force acting when it gets back to zero. And that's kind of interesting. So um, the result of that means that the momentum of the object is going to carry it right on past the equilibrium position, and then it gets displaced again in the other direction. So if we have a negative displacement, minus kx is going to lead to a positive force. And again, um, it's going to feel a push back towards the equilibrium position, but once again, when it gets there, there's no force, so it doesn't stop, and it repeats itself. We call this a restoring force. So it's always trying to get back to its equilibrium, but because it's a linear function, it never stops. It's always going to go right on past that equilibrium position. Right, and K is the spring constant. We've seen the spring constant show up before when we talked about potential energy in springs. So that's not a new thing. Now, to throw some vocabulary onto simple harmonic motion, we have a couple of key terms. So we're just going to walk through them really quick. Displacement is um, just the same thing that was when we defined displacement in the beginning of the semester. And the displacement's measured from some equilibrium point, or reference point is another way to think about it. Amplitude is the max displacement, a complete cycle back and forth. Uh, the time for that is called a period, and then Period is useful when we're talking about things that move rather slowly, like, say, planets. But if we have something that moves much faster than that, then usually we'll use the term frequency to essentially define the same thing, which is the characteristic time and how often something happens. So period is the time. Frequency is how often. And those are inverses of each other. So if we start off this um, harmonic motion and we're trying to find out what the K value is, it's relatively easy. You can just measure how much stretch you get out of a spring. And we've done, uh, we did a mini lab like that before uh, this whole business started. So that restoring force is key to telling us what that characteristic frequency is going to mean. And we'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's start off with a conversation about energy. So we know classic forms of energy, mechanical energy, kinetic energy, and spring potential energy. Now, in the previous example, we also had uh, gravitational potential energy. That's actually kind of tricky. So you can see that the spring gets stretched, but the uh, displacement, or at least the, the value that you would use to calculate gravitational potential energy would have to be established to some reference point, probably from the ground. But anyway, we're, for right now, we're just going to talk about these two kinds of energy, which are kinetic energy and spring potential energy. Now, since those two forms and energy is conserved, so the spring uh, force is a con conservative force, 
So since it's conserved, we can actually think about the endpoints of these two different kinds of energy. So when we have maximum displacement, the velocity is zero. So there is no kinetic energy. And then at the maximum displacement, since we call that amplitude, that's the value A, then the total energy can be expressed as one half Ka squared. Now at some point in between, the energy is going to be a mix between kinetic and potential. So the total amount of energy still is going to be a constant. That's one half Ka squared. So if you take this equation, which shows kinetic and potential equaling the total energy, you can reverse engineer that formula to get an idea about how fast it's going to be going at that equilibrium point. Because all the energy is going to be kinetic at that point. Right. Now this is a little bit complicated, but uh, what the suggestion is, is if you have something that was rotating with a, a fixed angular velocity and you looked at it from edge on, you'd actually get the same kind of motion. You get something that has max velocity um, as you look dead on at it. And then the relative velocity from your point of view would be zero at the different sides. And essentially what we're talking about is just the component. If you, I'm going to use my mouse here. If you look, this would be the component of the circular motion measured along the x-axis. So it starts off with a max displacement, gets smaller when theta is equal to 90 degrees, it's zero, and so on. So this could be modeled by the cosine function. Now, uh, let's take a look then at what the period and frequency, let's see how this uh, sugars off. You notice that we've got mass, which makes sense, and the spring constant. And why is one in the numerator and the one in the denominator? Well, more mass is going to mean mass resists a change in motion. So it's natural for that to make the period longer and the frequency less often. And the spring constant is the, well, where the force is coming from. So it makes sense that a stronger spring is going to have the effect of trying to move the mass faster, which would make the period less and the frequency higher. So now when we try and mathematically model those functions, we can use cosine or you could use sine, either one. They both have similar properties. and They, they both have uh, a period in which they repeat themselves. So amplitude up front, a cosine function is going to oscillate back and forth between negative one and plus one. And then the connection of frequency and period to this angular frequency is that Omega, which is the same thing that it was a couple of chapters ago, which is radians per second, angular velocity. And we can express that as two pi times the frequency uh, or two pi divided by the period. So again, frequency and period are inverses of each other. So if we try to plot what this looks like, you can see that the motion repeats itself. And whether we use cosine or sine, it doesn't really matter. It actually kind of depends on when you started the clock. So if we started the clock when, that means t equals zero when the displacement was maximum, then cosine seems appropriate. But if we started the clock when the displacement was zero, then sine is more appropriate. Now, this slide is a, an important one. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. What we see is displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Here, the clock started, the time was equal to zero when the displacement was maximum. So cosine is an appropriate fit for this. And it would be uh, amplitude A times the cosine of omega t. But velocity is zero at max displacement. And the reason why it goes negative in the beginning is because we assume that as we let this motion go, that the spring is trying to bring the bring the mass back to its equilibrium position. So that's why the velocity is negative. And then of course it turns around um, at the equilibrium position and then begins to slow down and becomes zero at the maximum displacement on the other side and the cycle continues. Now the acceleration is exactly the opposite of displacement. Why? Because of Hooke's law. F 
equals kx. And you can even see we have the amplitudes spelled out here that the uh, amplitude of the acceleration is, well, there it is. Um, looks kind of like F equals MA, but in this case, we've got the force of the spring, which is K times A, and that equals mass times acceleration. So if you're finding acceleration, divide both sides by mass. But the minus sign means that this equation is flipped. So when the displacement is a maximum positive number, the acceleration is a maximum negative. And then we take a look at uh, things that we already have results of. We already have talked about the fact that the max velocity is going to be related to the amplitude and the spring constant and the mass. And then the acceleration has also got to be related to those. Notice how it looks like uh, almost the same thing as the max velocity, except the, the square root sign is gone. Right, so it's almost like it was that squared. Okay, good. I'm just gonna talk about the pendulum briefly. It's another example of simple harmonic motion, the simple pendulum. And you know, if you're thinking about that term, simple harmonic motion, you can, we do this a lot in physics. We start off with, um, <laughs> we start off with the simplest case first before we move on to complex. So we do that a lot in physics. I don't know if they do that in chemistry. It seems like they often start with the complex because they like it more. Anyway, so the restoring force for our pendulum, if you remember we did a pendulum in the very first night of class, is gravity. And if we use a small angle approximation, then it turns out that um, the, <clears throat> the period um, is going to be determined by the length of the pendulum, surprisingly, and not the angle and not the mass. So that's interesting. Why doesn't the mass make a difference? And the answer is because the force itself depends on the mass. And so if the force depends on the mass and then the force equals mass times acceleration, it's going to cancel on both sides. And even with the angle, the angle doesn't really matter that much either. Uh, so you can see it talks about the small angle approximation and there the table in the lower right hand corner is showing you that sine theta is approximately equal to theta as long as the angles are small and we're talking about the angle in radians. So for five degrees this is pretty much the same but it's after like 10 and 15 then we start to see some error. But regardless of that since uh, gravity is the restoring force then we can see formulas for period and uh, frequency for a pendulum. Longer pendulum. <clears throat> Essentially, um, one way to think about this, why, why does the period increase with length? And uh, essentially what it is is that um, the pendulum has more rotational inertia because it's longer. So it's a little harder to get it going. And gravity uh, is the source of the force, and so if gravity was stronger, then the period would be shorter, so that's why it's in the denominator. And that is a good place for us to stop, and I wanted to do a couple of practice problems. So I'm going to hop out um, of the presentation, and I'm going to change video. So I'll stop sharing, and then you get to see me. Hi. And then we're going to go to I'll change the video so that we can check out. Uh, let's see. Sherry says she doesn't have a call in number. So let me see if I can get one for her. Looks like Sherry got it. 
so she's connecting so I'm gonna hold off on that and I'm gonna go to uh, my document camera I got booted off for a second. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> Oops, sorry, I need to turn off my virtual background. All right, cool. Do you see my document camera? Just give me a thumbs up. Thanks, Beth. And let's do a quick test, because every time I do this, it seems a little bit different. Does that look like the letter P to you? Or is it backwards? Thumbs up? Yes, that looks, looks like P. Yay. Okay, cool. Thanks, Kelby. All right, let's do a, a quick example, and um, let's see what this looks like. So, first of all, Let's take an example that looks like this. So here's our string. And this is what it looks like when nothing's attached to it. Then we take that same spring and we add a mass to it. And it stretches out a little bit. Oof, it's not very square. Okay, we put it on two kilograms and we see a stretch that's equal to four centimeters. Then we're gonna pull it down a little bit more. So we're gonna pull it down another two centimeters. So we pull it down and then like let it go and then it's gonna start to oscillate. So a problem for this kind of question might be uh, write an equation of motion for its displacement as a function of time. Now I know this is vertical, I probably could have written Y as a function of T, but it's okay. All right, so what are good steps here? Uh, good steps would include number one, is to find K. So for our K value, what's happened is that the spring is providing a force that's equal to the weight. So, F equals K X. I'm leaving out the minus sign because we're doing this for sort of like an absolute value point of view. The spring provides a force of minus K X, but what we do is we provide a positive K X in order to stretch it. All right, and then so that force is equal to the weight. So MG is equal to K X. FYI, I'm recording this too, so I'll post this on to uh, on to Canvas. And so MG, we've got two, and what planet we're on, we're on Earth. And so I'm looking for the K value, so K is gonna be equal to MG over X. And so the stretch is four centimeters. That's gonna be written as 0 0.04 though, if we're gonna get SI units. And then mass times gravity, two times 9.8 is 19.6. Okay. Great, can somebody do that for me really quick? I realized I left my calculator over, uh, over by the couch. <laughs> So if you get an answer, uh, please go ahead. And... Magically, my calculator has arrived. It's amazing. 
uh, on that on the right part, the 19 by sixty-five by it's four ninety. What is what I got? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so four hundred ninety, and kind of interesting units. It's newtons per meter. So these K values tend to be pretty big because this. It's how many newtons it would take to stretch at a whole meter, and most springs don't stretch a whole meter. Yeah. We're, not, we're not stretching it close to a meter here. That's right. Okay, cool. So now we need to find out what this uh, frequency is going to be, or the period. Okay, so the angular frequency, so this is going to be in radians per second, is equal to the square root of... And the way I remember this formula is that I know mass is going to slow it down and spring strength is going to speed it up. So this is K over M. And so we have the square root of 490. I'm going to leave the units off it for right now. Divided by the mass is 2. And I get 15.7 radians per second. How's that sound? Yeah. Okay. And so now we can put all these together into an equation of motion, and that's going to look like this. X is equal to, and you can really, Use uh, whatever units you want here, whatever's convenient. So I'm going to write 0 0.02 with a minus sign in front of it. And yeah, I can do a better job of that, sorry. And if I was asked for the frequency or period, then that's a pretty easy task. So uh, the period is equal to 2 pi. Um, over omega, and then frequency is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. All right, let's go back to this equation of motion then. Sorry, there's a little glare there. And let's talk about what's happening. So why the choice of these? All right, so 15.7, that's omega. 0 0.02, that's how much I pulled it down by. So that was this initial displacement. And then I let it go and it's gonna bob up and down as the spring does battle with gravity. Why negative? Because my initial displacement was downward. And why cosine is because when the motion started, the displacement was a maximum. If it started at zero, if that's where I started the clock, then sine would have been a good function to choose. All right, I'm gonna pause for a second and see if there are any questions about that. Feel free to grab a screenshot if you want. Good, and now I'm just gonna do uh, one more example, and then this one is gonna be around energy. So this time we're gonna start off with an equation, and uh, let's say that x as a function of time is gonna be equal to uh, five, times the cosine of 2.8 t. And then this is for 
a three kilogram mass. And the prompt may be something like this. Um, find K. and amplitude and max velocity? That's a good question. Okay, well, if we're gonna find K, then we need to uh, start off here. I'm gonna be a little unconventional and start over on this side because I'm a lefty and this whole whiteboard thing just doesn't work really well for me when I'm uh, writing it on a table. So anyway, here we go. We know that omega is equal to 2.8, and that's also equal to the square root of k over m. So we're gonna square both sides and multiply both sides by the mass, which is three. So this is pretty straightforward. And so I get uh, 23.5 Newtons per meter. Now the energy total could be equal to one half well, the spring potential energy is one half kx squared, but at the maximum displacement, that's one half k a squared. Or we could do max kinetic energy, which would be one half m v max squared. So which way do we go? Well, v max squared is one of the things we have to find. So we'll hold off on that. We can get that after we get the total energy, but A, <clears throat> right, that's amplitude, and then that's the number in front of the cosine. Sometimes we use the term modulation. The five is modulating the size of the cosine function. So we we'll multiply this by five. Um, A squared, well, that's gonna be five squared, so our total energy is gonna be equal to one half. Our K value is 23.5. And the amplitude is five. So that's 294 joules. And then we set that equal to one half. And the mass is three, as we said before. and Vmax squared. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by two and then divide both sides by three. And so that's telling me that Vmax squared equals 196. And so Vmax is equal to square root of that. Ah. And that's 14. There we go. So we'll get a big screenshot of that if you want. From the window here. There we go. All right. So, a um, couple of announcements. The um, quiz for chapter nine is up, and you can access that right after this. I'm going to post the quiz for for ten. They're pretty straightforward. Just two problems and uh, and two conceptual questions. All right, does anybody have any questions for me?
All right, great. So don't forget that you can uh, complete uh, five conceptual questions and five problems from our syllabus and email those to me. And thank you very much for folks who've been sending that in. That's been great. Okay. So I'm going to sign off and I'll be happy to take your questions over uh, email too. So anything before we sign out? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Yeah.